Good afternoon. I'm David Grayson, the Chair of the Institute of Business Ethics, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our latest webinar. And our guest today is Rob, Rob Hayward, up in um, Edinburgh. And Rob, thank you so much for joining us. You are the principal author of a very interesting, very important new study, which the IBE was delighted to be a very junior partner in, but I'm um, pleased to be part of um, the new global ethics study, which Prince Appear, of which Rob is the chief operating officer, um, has recently launched. So in a moment, I'm gonna hand over to Rob to talk us through some of the key messages, and then we'll do a deep dive around some of the points in particular in relation to building and sustaining an ethical culture and the difficulties of doing that, especially now during the, the COVID um, pandemic and what we think is going to be a very different world of work going forward. But um, just first of all, just to remind you, we would love to get lots of questions coming in. So please do use the, um, the chat room function. Um, and if you would like to tweet during the course um, of this uh, webinar, please do so. Um, at IBE um, UK, of course, is, is our Twitter handle. Rob, thank you so much for doing this webinar today. What were the key messages from this ethics study? Good. David, well, thank you and, and, and really great pleasure to, to be with you. And, and thank you not only for, for the invite to, uh, to be with you and, and to talk through the study, but also for, for the guidance and support of, of IBE through the study. I think, you know, it's one of the things as perhaps we'll talk about later that really came out very strongly from the research was a desire to share more of what companies are doing and, and share best and emerging practice and, and lessons. And I think, you know, platforms like this and, and like the work that, that you do at the IBE is going to be crucial to actually moving from, from that aspiration that we see to, to, towards action and, and real integration of, of ethics. So, so really pleased to, to have the opportunity to, to talk through the, the study. And maybe before I talk about the kind of key takeaways, maybe just a, a little bit of background of, of how the study came about. So, so at Principia, we are we're a network of academics um, drawing a lot of uh, specialists from academic philosophy, behavioral science, occupational psychology, uh, and bringing those together with consultants uh, and practitioners as well, essentially around a common mission of building ethical organizations. So our heritage, our history really began in uh, financial services, so working with the Wall Street banks post-financial crisis, looking at how they could think differently about really integrating different approaches to conduct, to culture, often with the, the, the regulators breathing down their necks, asking them to show how an approach that was more sophisticated than simply compliance rules and, and policing could be a little more effective. Uh, in, in building back post-crisis. But then our work's extended to work with uh, with Silicon Valley companies, a lot around kind of responsible innovation, um, ethical use of technology, as well as increasingly with startups as well. So smaller companies looking to integrate ethics, values, principles uh, as they grow. So that's our background. And really we we kind of achieve that mission of, of building ethical organizations through, through two, two ways. One is through our work directly with, with our clients and the other is through our, our research. And as we came in really kind of this time last year um, to, 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 the, to the pandemic, and we were starting to kind of hear from our clients and our networks about the impact that that was having for, for business leaders, there was a real parallel for us, I think, between what we were seeing around the impact of perceptions of ethics in business and perhaps, as, as you'll remember well, the, the impact that the financial crisis had on CSR and sustainability, you know, 10, 12, 12 years ago. And I remember very clearly kind of coming out of the financial crisis, people were saying, you know, is this the end of CSR? You know, are we now going to kind of go back to basics, get rid of all that fluffy stuff and go back to, to what business should really be, you know, making profits for, for, for shareholders? And what was very clear, and I remember leading research for, for the UN Global Compact at the time and talking to CEOs during that year, kind of 09 to, to 2010, and being very clear that absolutely the reverse was true, that actually the financial crisis has acted, if you like, as, as something of a clearinghouse for sustainability. So the projects that really were the kind of 
PR led stuff on on the margins of business that was gone but actually that kind of integration of core business had, had really accelerated and I think what we set out to do was understand was there a similar impact on notions of purpose of ethics in business during during this crisis and so we took really a, a two-pronged approach so first was um, interviews with senior leaders and I was actually just saying but you know before we before we started the uh, the webinar in all the times I've kind of been through a research cycle like this these kind of interviews with business leaders these conversations were so different and it's very interesting I was remarking to Alex before we started 10 years ago when we were doing these video interviews we'd hire a hotel suite you'd bring in a, a camera crew and CEOs would come in you know tie done up clutching their brief from the comms department and they'd give you the the kind of lines to take this time you're talking to CEOs in their kitchen their kids are behind them they might be cooking dinner while they're talking to you and the conversations were so different and I don't know how much of it is just talking to people in their home environment and how much is a sense of actually we're all in this together a bit of a shared sense of of grief I think in some cases about the last year of uncertainty um, and of that kind of collective desire to build back better but it was a it was a really kind of revealing series of interviews particularly with leaders talking around the difficult ethical judgment calls and dilemmas that leaders have faced through through this period and so those conversations combined with with a survey of another 750 companies uh, across I think 90 countries with a really good representation and this was important to us from from the global south as well so this isn't just Western Europe the US this is a, a genuinely global survey looking at big multinationals and, and SMEs as well so those two coming together really to give us what we think is is the most extensive research on on attitudes and integration of, of ethics into business maybe then the, the kind of key takeaways maybe I'll, I'll pick out kind of three things that are in my mind and then I want to leave plenty of time for us to kind of delve deeper and, and open up for questions but and I'll give you my kind of my, my kind of personal three takeaways so I guess one is that that sense of the impact of the crisis has really played out in very significantly changing I think the way that ethics in business is understood so you know in all the time at Principia we've been working on these issues we've tended to in, in, in encounter two camps of school uh, of thought you know when you first say ethics one is oh you mean ethics and compliance you know that's fine my compliance department deals with the ethics stuff and so it's no more complicated than that we just follow the rules right and there's another school of thought which says oh ethics that's the the fluffy stuff and you know the guy in sandals reading the guardian at the end of the corridor he deals with that so we don't worry about that this isn't you know for the ceo office or for the you know or, or for the, the the boardroom table and that to me has fundamentally changed and i think it's really it was beginning to change but i think it's really accelerated this year and i think leaders have seen one that they face more and more decisions this year that were never about the black and white right and wrong what can we do what are we allowed to do call the lawyer and say what what, what can we do here but decisions like you know if you're in in an industry where demand has fallen off a cliff you know if you're in hospitality say what do you do with your teams what do you do with your people do you lay people off who you don't have an immediate demand for? Do you keep people on? Do you use government furlough schemes? And all those have been such judgment calls that people are saying, you know, this is no longer about compliance. And maybe we can, we can talk more about, you know, the, the, the way those two fit together and maybe should be dragged apart a little bit. But neither is it the kind of fluffy values thing that we can leave to someone else. This is a core business decision. So that's maybe number one. I think number two for me is a realization that for companies to live up to greater expectations you know and we're talking we we talk all the time about you know this era of radical transparency we talk about employee activism we talk about greater investor scrutiny i think really leaders have realized that in order to live up to those expectations really integrating and embedding ethics values principles is that is the next step because it's no longer i think around having a statement of purpose or values on the website and then we go and make business decisions somewhere else without reference to those and it was really clear through all of the conversations we had quite how much those companies who'd really spent time integrating values translating the statement of purpose into 
decision making frameworks that took ethics and values into account and meant they're not always simply reverting to talking about the purpose here and making a decision based on financials over here. So that I think is a, is a growing realization. And I think the study shows a, a kind of acceptance and an acknowledgement that there is a real gap between aspiration and, and action there. For the most part, because it's simply hard. This is tough, this is really difficult work. So that, that's probably number two. And then maybe number three, and this in some ways kind of links back to the, the point around the kind of parallels with sustainability, is that I think for me, the most interesting takeaway that came from our conversations and, and from the survey data as well, was an acceptance and a commitment that ethics, values, principles in decision making have to take precedence over short term financial considerations. And that sounds an easy thing to say, but actually I think it's a re it's a mark of a real shift in intention, if not yet in, in kind of realization and action. Because, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, I think we've heard every few years there's a new wave of excuses why the private sector isn't doing more on sustainability, on global development, why the private sector is not scaling up its contribution to the SDGs. And sometimes we hear, well, you know, it's all about investors. If they cared, we'd do more. Sometimes you hear it's about consumers. If they really made choices based on sustainability, then we'd do more. Then you hear it's about governments. If governments gave us the level playing field, then we'd do more. And what's really interesting to me is again and again, we heard, I think, from leaders this sense of frustration about why have we been making these excuses? We've been shying away from what we know to be right because you know, our investors who are interested in quarterly returns are going to give us a kick in. Um, and I think you know, we've seen some examples of, of that lately, which we, we might talk about. But I think it's interesting that leaders are saying it's now up to us. You know, we have enormous power as leaders of multinationals unless we pursue what we know to be right. And unless we can get over those barriers because the system is not moving fast enough, then actually we're morally culpable for, for a failure to do the right thing. So I think that for me is probably the third and, and perhaps you know, the, the most interesting current, I think, in the, in the conversations we've had. Super, thank you very much indeed, Rob, for that introduction to the ethics study. I'd like to drill down a little bit straight away. Did you see some really creative thinking around the consequence of those key takeaways in terms of and therefore mm. we have actually elevated this in terms of our boardroom discussions we have decided that this should be a fundamental part of a revamped responsible business or sustainability committee of the board or whatever or we've decided that we are going to have this as a standing item in in, in some way did you did you see mm. any any early evidence of changes in the way that boards have been tasked? Mm. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think, you know, one of the things that we saw very clearly um, in the research was more and more boards either taking these issues in a protected space at, at full board. So it not being, and I remember someone saying, you know, it used to be even two years ago that we had the board agenda and then it was ESG and sustainability and ethics in the last five minutes. And quite often that would be shunted off the agenda because of time. We, we've all been in those meetings. And I think now we're seeing either through, you know, the establishment of um, particular committees. So social reputation, ethics committees, I think are, are growing in, in number and in stature or taking it at full board. I think that's really changing. I think we're probably still at the point of kind of pilot and illustration of that happening rather than a real generalized shift. You know, if you look at some of the data in the study, I think we, we show that fewer than, you know, less than half of the companies we surveyed have board oversight of ethics, despite almost everyone saying actually this has to start at the board level. So again, that's one of those gaps, I think, between, between aspiration and, and action. But then I guess the other thing that we've really seen is an elevation of the idea of ethics and, and guiding principles to the level where they're being signed off by the board, by executive management teams. And actually, one of the case studies we have in the, in the study is around uh, Salesforce and their Office of Ethical and Humane Use. And that was a fascinating example to me because that was an example to me of a company 
coming from an industry which has traditionally said, you know, we innovate, we design products, and how those products are used is essentially beyond our, our remit. And Salesforce being, you know, the first to take on, you know, that build that function around ethical use, to me was shifting the line of moral responsibility. They were saying, actually, how our products are used and the impacts that our products have are our responsibility. And you know the case study in the in the research shows how they essentially set up a C-suite office around ethical use and the humane use of technology, established ethical guiding principles that were signed off by the board, that were signed off by the executive management team, and are now applied to difficult, complex use cases around who is allowed to buy that technology, who's allowed to use it, for what ends they're allowed to use it. And so for me, I think that's one of the great examples of this going from you know, intention and positive statements around the impact that we have in the world to actually helping you make really tough decisions and, and trade-offs actually, where, you know, ethics and values do trump financial interests in, in decision-making. Now, as you said, Rob, there are a number of, of kind of mini case study vignettes in, in the report. Just give us a couple more, if you, if you would, that you think, gosh, I've been involved in this area one way or another for a few years now. You started very, very young, of course. Um, that, I think, is a really, really interesting innovation. That's going to be worth watching very carefully over the next yeah. couple of years. So, I mean, one that really sticks in my mind is uh, the example of Echo Bank. So the, the Pan-African Bank, who have operations in, I think, 33 countries uh, across Africa. And you know, representing a huge range of cultural backgrounds, historical backgrounds, and also occupying you know different roles in the in the development of the group. So they started as a West African regional bank. Over the last 10, 15 years, have really grown the footprint to, to be the largest Pan African bank. And they, the question they went in with was, you know, when we talk about culture and ethics how do we get a sense of what that means to people as we sit in in headquarters they're headquartered in lome in, in togo as we sit here in lome with one view of what ethics means to a banking group does that mean the same for people in nairobi does that mean the same for people in a satellite office in in paris and they had traditional data to measure cultures they had engagement surveys they had you know outcome data like compliance data risk data and you know, I think you talk to every company now about, uh, and they say, we've got far too much data, we're just not quite sure how to interpret it. And what they've done is essentially built a, a system which enables them to track the core drivers of ethical culture and ethical decision-making across the 33 countries in the group. And so what leaders at, at group level essentially now have is a dashboard which they can look at, which talks directly not to engagement or employee satisfaction or at the other end of things you know operational risk loss data which is after the fact and therefore difficult to to interpret but actually gives them the data in the middle which says how confident can we be that our people are capable have clear responsibilities and are motivated and incentivized to do the right thing and by that we mean you know to do the right thing for their customers, for the for the bank, for the communities they serve. How confident can we be that we're in the right place to deliver the right outcomes? And you know, for for me, that ability to understand ethics not just as a as a commitment, but actually as something that is dependent on decision making capabilities, incentives, motivations. That decision making muscle in people, not just at the board and leadership team, but right down through the organization. And the ability that we can measure that. Culture isn't some amorphous, fluffy thing that we can only feel. We can measure it. We can measure the important facts. And that, to me, feels like a real a, a real leap, I think. And we know, of course, that there are increasing regulatory requirements, increasing yep. expectations on boards of companies that they will be more proactive in yeah. defining the desired culture of their organization and not just then defining it but also periodically checking dipstick like to see is the actual culture around the place mm -hmm. the way people really are doing things around here what we desire 
in terms of a, an ethical culture and so on. I, I think that's right. And, and I think it's interesting to some extent, I think we're beginning to see regulators get slightly impatient about progress there. You know, if you look at the FRC's latest update to the corporate governance code, it's very clear that what they're saying is, please, this time, take this seriously. We really want to see better data on culture. And you've got, you know, APRA, the prudential regulator in Australia now, I think they gave banks a year's grace during the last year as they, you know, focused on, on stability of the system. But they're now saying, you know, we want to see with quantitative evidence how the culture of the bank influences the way risk is managed. And they are very, very clear that they want to see proper quantitative evidence. And then, you know, you, and you look at the SEC's new disclosure requirements around human capital as well. So the guidance that came in in October, November last year saying you need to disclose as a publicly traded company in the US, the material human capital metrics that materially impact your business. And, you know, I think there's a huge gulf. If you look at uh, PwC did some great research at the end of last year, looking at the first quarter of filings under the new guidance, showed that something like 80% of companies were reporting, you know, headcount, attrition, you know, the really easy off the shelf HR metrics that mean very little. Less than 20% had reported anything about culture. And of those 20%, you can imagine most are probably reporting engagement statistics, because still most companies you ask, what data do you have on culture? They say, here's our engagement survey. Now, if, you know, even if you take that 20%, one in five companies reporting anything around culture, and yet they're all ticking the box that says, we're reporting everything around our human capital, which has a material impact on our business. Four out of those five companies are wrong. Uh, and I suspect the SEC and, and investors are gonna start pointing that out rather more vigorously. And so do you think that Realistically, the people who were willing to talk to you to respond to the ethics study are those people who are in the leadership cohort and they will be trying to follow the tougher guidance, etc., and requirements. And actually, you've still got a huge number. Of, of, of the laggards and, and, and the people who are either struggling or think this too will pass kind of thing. Yeah. Um, or do you think post the crisis, we will see a, a real shift in terms of, of, of how companies are reporting on mm. these issues? So it's interesting. So I think, I mean, it's a great point, I think, on the kind of representativeness of, of research like this. And I think it's important to acknowledge that by no means is research like this ever representative of the kind of what I would call the kind of broad swathe of, of global business. You know, it's it's very much a view of the leaders. Uh, and in some ways, actually, that kind of highlights even more the gap between aspiration and, and action that we see amongst those companies. You know, if you've got, you know, just to pick one example, you've got 90 odd percent of leaders saying that having an inclusive culture is essential to being an ethical organization. So the intent's there, the aspiration's there, the understanding is there of what it means to be ethical. And then only 40 odd percent have got a diversity and inclusion program. L less than 35%, I think, have targets for diversity and inclusion. So that to me is just one example of even among leaders who were prepared to give us an hour of their time, who were prepared to you know, complete the survey, who were compared, to participate in a research initiative specifically around ethics that's how big the gap is so when you go and look at you know when you go and look at other businesses how big is the gap there uh and, and the, the safe answer is probably even bigger and significantly bigger um that said you know the second part of your question i think i am optimistic um around kind of the the pace of change and partly, I think, because you know there, there are a number of reasons, but I think partly it's because, to some extent, the cat is now out of the bag that business leaders have a huge amount of space to exercise judgment, moral judgment. And I think we've seen a bit of a narrative, as I talked about at the beginning, of, well, we would do more, but our hands are tied. You know, we have to serve the, the needs of, of investors. And I think now we've seen, actually, that's not true. Partly because we've seen some, you know, braver leaders stand up and say, we're going to do the right thing. If this isn't the company you want to invest in, good. 
Now, we've seen signs of optimism before, you know, Paul Parliament standing up at Davos 10 years ago and saying, if you're an investor interested in quarterly returns, please don't invest in Unilever because that's not how we run the business. Now, I think at the time we all said, great, well, this will go through the industry. I think by any measure it hasn't. So, you know, optimism is perhaps kind of tempered by experience, but I do think to, to a great extent, uh, and this may be something we, we, we can talk about, but employee activism, I think, is key as well, is, is people saying, you know, if we've, if we've seen the kind of investors, governments, consumers thing fall by the wayside, that access and the kind of the war for talent, retaining the good people now, and we're seeing this very strongly in Silicon Valley, depends on closing that gap between the kind of professed values and how we act and the decisions that, that we make. And companies are being called out on that very quickly. And I think that that idea of, of employee activism mm. and employees calling out what they can so clearly see as, as a, a mismatch is, is probably something that, that we will see more, do you, do you think? And, I, 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 and, and just whilst you're thinking about that, Rob, just to, to say to everyone on this webinar, we're delighted um, that you can join us today. Uh, to talk to Rob Hayward from Principia about the ethics study. Please, if you have some questions that you would like to pose uh, to Rob about the study, please do use the question uh, function. Um, is, is employee activism, do you think, going to be a more powerful tool as we come out of, hopefully, the, the pandemic? I think so. And I, and I would, I think, go as far as to say at the moment, I think it's the single strongest driver of companies beginning to take ethics, ethical decision making more seriously. And I, I say that particularly, I think, looking at, at Silicon Valley and tech, I think it's 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 really powerful force there. Um, because what you've got there is, you know, a huge concentration of high growth firms all looking and competing for the same talent. And I think it's become very, very clear, one, that that's becoming an increasing factor in people's choice of where to work. You know, there are any number of studies now that show that people will very happily trade off uh, compensation particularly, but other factors are around work for a belief in a mission and a purpose of the organization and are very quick to one, speak up and to two, leave and vote with their feet when they see hypocrisy, when they see a gap between what we say externally and what we see internally. Now, I think that's both with regard to the internal environment within firms uh, and actually how we relate to one another as, as colleagues, uh, but also in terms of you know, the impact um, that companies are having on society, how seriously they take those, those responsibilities. Um, you know, if you look at the, the Edelman Trust Barometer that came out at the end of last year, I think there were 50% of people were saying they were more likely to engage in workplace protest than a year ago. And that's a phenomenal jump in a year. And, that, and that's not just, the question's not just how likely are you to kind of speak up around your company's behavior or decisions it makes, but actually to engage in workplace protest. And that's a, that's a real big jump. And I think, you know, it, again, it's one of those where the cat is now out of the bag. It's become a, uh, you know, in some cases, an accepted point where you are kind of, you're you're morally obligated actually to speak up when you see your employer doing something that you feel contravenes your values and the values of the organization you're obliged to, to speak up and i think people are, are really stepping up to that mark and that leads to a question from um, jim bignall who asked if in fact um, employees could be expected to sign a a pledge that that they they promise to behave in conformity with their organization's code of ethics and so on. I know some organizations already do that. Do you think that is something that should be more widespread as part of the quid pro quos? That if employees are saying, we feel we have a responsibility to speak up if we see behavior of which we, we disapprove, which we think is inconsistent with mm -hmm. the way the government that the company has declared it wants to to run the business then should there also be a little bit of, of reciprocity in terms of the the employees promising that they will observe 
the ethics code as well? So I have a I have a bit of a kind of internal debate on this one. So I think employee pledges can be incredibly powerful. Um, and actually EchoBank, who I talked about earlier, uh, as part of the rollout of their revised kind of behavioral standards around culture and ethics, actually had a public pledge, first by their leaders, who in town hall meetings would have the pledge on the wall and they would personally sign the pledge on the wall in front of their employees and then would ask all of their people to, to, to do the same. And I think it can be really powerful, primarily actually in, in going back to the point from earlier, splitting out those notions of ethics and compliance but actually there's compliance and of course we ask you to to obey that and that's a kind of that's a non-negotiable but so is actually conducting yourself in a way that's consistent with with values and asking yourself those two questions you know not only can i but should i and i think you know having that in people's minds as a kind of expectation of conduct and behavior is important but and i think it's a significant but I think one of the biggest traps I think the companies are falling into right now is pushing down that idea of where the responsibility lies. So, you know, we set the rules and the standards and it's up to you to comply. And if you don't comply, well, we'll just fire you. You know, we've seen, I think, you know, several major companies recently facing kind of suggestions of a culture that really doesn't meet the values that they espouse and they, they profess to live by. And the response in some cases I've seen has been, well, you know, we have some bad apples here who behave in ways that are inconsistent with, 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 with our values and we, we'll get rid of those people. And to me, that's one of the biggest red flags that leaders just do not get it. This sense of, you know, this is, this is bad apples because, you know, it underestimates leaders, I think, responsibility to shape that behavior to shape the environment in which their people you know are not only able to but encouraged to are given the support to to make good ethical decisions and i think you know in to some extent it's one of the great myths that came out of the financial crisis that you know people are either born ethical or unethical and if you happen to hire an unethical one well you've just got to get rid of them quickly you know i think one of the things that we saw in in every analysis of the crisis was these were good people for the most part put in incredibly difficult situations, exercising moral judgment. And so I think, you know, if you're a company who's going to ask your people to sign up to, to a pledge or a commitment to behavior, you've got to match that with a similar commitment to giving them the, the support, um, you know, formally and informally, so that, you know, the, the technical support and knowledge, but also the space to discuss those gray area dilemmas and issues uh, that you're asking them to, to, to navigate. And indeed, of course, that's music to the ears of the, the Institute of Business Ethics, because we say, yes, having codes of ethics, for example, are really important, but they are pretty marginal unless you do the training programs, you do the leadership by example, you have the consistent reinforcement of the messages through regular yeah. communication and so on. I think that, that message about it is a responsibility of leadership to give people the tools and to support them so that they do feel empowered and genuinely they are enabled yes. to be able to uh, to understand what is 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 required of them and to and to do the right thing now we we're getting some good questions coming in now so please keep them coming um and there's an interesting observation from adam williamson saying back to employee activism mm. yes um it's maybe easy in those sectors like silicon valley where there's a huge demand the war for talent is really a very hot war but unfortunately there are going to be lots of, of sectors around the world in the next year two years post the crisis where there's going to be increased unemployment and therefore people may be much more fearful in a whole series of, 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 of different sectors. And therefore, how, I think this is the, the spirit of Adam's question, how realistic is this employee activism as a, as a driver to keep business leaders ethical and on the ball on these questions? I, I think that's a great point, Adam. And, and I think, you know, it's, 
in some ways there is an ivory tower perspective which i'm sure i am and others are guilty of of saying well you know everyone should just speak up everyone should hold their employers to account Re and not recognizing sometimes the fact that you know the kind of precarity of many people's lives right now are going are always going to lead towards you know if i feel like i'm putting my head above the parapet to raise something am i going to take that risk and i think it's interesting actually one of the in the work we do with our clients and a kind of diagnostic around ethical culture one of the strongest leading indicators we see it over whether a, an organization has the culture it can be confident in its people behaving ethically and the organization getting to, to the right place consistently and reliably is how confident people feel in raising a hand and crucially whether people that raise a hand are respected and valued because i think we've all been in organizations where if you're the person raising a hand saying i'm not sure about this i have a worry about this then you're just not invited to the next meeting and maybe when the you know next promotion comes up the next opportunity comes up someone else gets it and i think some of us have been lucky enough to be in organizations where those are actually the people that are really valued it's not the rainmakers it's not the alphas it's not the people who've been here forever it's the people who actually are brave enough and courageous enough to raise a hand to ask those difficult questions and that again is one of those where you know the responsibility comes comes back to to, to leaders um, maybe one other point on on that question is there is i think a constituency which tends to get really overlooked in a lot of these conversations and that's organized labor and unions and i think you know one of the best things that could happen for me to to actually to hold business to account to hold organizations and leaders to account would be to see unions actually stronger again um, and to see you know the voice of the employee not having to depend on individuals taking risks with their livelihoods their family's livelihood and, and in the precarious circumstances so many people are finding themselves in but actually in a space where people can speak collectively can act collectively and going to have if you like that kind of safety in numbers which is you know giving an organization a very clear signal of what its employees expect which isn't putting individuals on the line for, for that kind of retaliation yes i was uh, interviewing on another webinar for a different organization recently shannon um, burroughs the general secretary of the international trade union confederation who was incredibly articulate about the importance of just transition and so on yep. and, and the role that organized labor um, when it's operating effectively can play in supporting organizations in, in, in making that kind of transition and obviously by extension pursuing um, more ethical business practice. Um, an interesting factual question um, from Simon, Simon Thomason, um, asking for some specific um, examples um, of the Ecobank, the, the different quantitative measures of, of ethics that they're using in Ecobank. That's welcoming one of our IBU vice presidents. Uh. Good. Well, no, that's a great question, and and I can't talk specifically to to Ecobank system, but but I, you know I can talk if you like about you know the the approach that we take. So actually, you know, one of the things that we've we've worked on at Principia over the last kind of five years or so uh, is what we call our ethical culture index. And that was essentially a realization that there was a gap between, if you like, the the engagement and employee satisfaction statistics that HR tend to hold and the kind of outcome data that risk compliance. So in the financial sector, you're looking at things like operational risk loss. And there was a gap in, in the middle there. And so what we did, actually, and this is kind of based on our work with with academics who look at, you know, what does it take to, to be an ethical organization? and translating the kind of the findings from the empirical research into survey questions. And I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Actually, one is that the piece I just mentioned around people who challenge their superiors are respected and valued. Now, that's a very specific question that, that we ask in the Ethical Culture Index, and it's a really strong indicator of, of, of performance and, and organizational culture. Um, other things that we look at, as you'd expect, we look at incentives. So we look at, you know, to what extent are um, the values and the behavior that we say we expect of people 
actually reflected in performance so are they reflected in the people that are promoted given opportunities are they reflected in in bonuses in in, in environments where where that's a, a significant factor in, in motivating and incentivizing people we look at you know the uh, you use the phrase tone, tone from the top at the beginning but also that kind of echo from below if you like you know so what am i hearing from leaders and is that actually kind of resonant through the firm or is it a, a message that kind of comes out by email every month and disappears in, into the ether? So we look at that, but actually one thing I'll tell you, um, and you know, very happy to, to share more of, uh, on this afterwards, but um, one thing that was a real surprise to me, one of the first times that we rolled out the Ethical Culture Index, um, the single strongest correlate, and we were able to essentially correlate the Ethical Culture Index data with conduct data the single most predictive factor was people's understanding of and feeling of connection to the purpose of the organization so above you know what they hear from leaders above the training they have above how they're compensated i went into that as a bit of a purpose skeptic you know they kind of thought that you know we're talking all about purpose it's on the website does it really change the way that people behave it really does it turns out um, and so, you know, and that's for me is one of those advantages of being able to measure and correlate that data. If you're measuring the levers, the drivers, the core factors that shape the way people behave and influence their decision making, you then know where to make where to put the effort in terms of communication, training, OD efforts, and you can measure the return on investment as well. You know, the the number of times I've talked to HR teams who've said we've got these 30 programs all around ethics and culture we've no idea which are making a difference. As soon as you start measuring the core drivers, you can show, you can measure, you know, population A have had this experience, population B did this, what impact has it had on, on the way that they see the culture and, and, and the way that people around them are behaving? Um, so that's, that's a few of the things that I think are, are kind of changing the way that organizations think about, about what to measure. And that's a perfect segue into a little poll that we would like to post if, if we can now please um, and she's a question about purpose um, and thinking to the organization that you are most uh, involved with or most recently have been involved with do you agree or disagree my organization has a clear purpose beyond profit so if, if you can vote now and we will give just a few moments for that poll to to run and for folk to find the the poll on the screen and to hopefully to to vote so hmm. so we've got Yep, yeah, okay. This is the Institute of Business Ethics. So I would have been, I think, surprised <laughs> if we'd had a lot of, of, of disagreement, but a not inconsiderable uh, minority um, saying that they don't agree with, with the, the statement. It's one of your key recommendations, and the, the ethics study is, 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 is really good because not only does it have this really helpful analysis, but it also then has. 10 key things that we should be doing something about uh, as, as, as a result of, of trying to improve uh, an ethical culture. Um, any reflections, Rob, quickly on that poll? Yeah, I mean, as you say, I think it's it's the foundation of, of everything else. You know, before you can answer to me ethical questions and questions about the right thing to do, you have to know why you exist, you know, how you create value who you create value for, and also that honest accounting of, of kind of purpose around, you know, actually what risks and harms do we impose? So if you look at, you know, look at the banking sector, we talked about the, the financial crisis earlier, and actually we know that the bigger organizations, the bigger businesses, the bigger sectors go, the more integral a role they play in our economy, the more systemic risks and harms that, that they impose. And I would venture to say, a lot of the big financial institutions had their decisions around what to do and how to do it been driven by a clearer sense of purpose that was beyond shareholder value that was beyond profit they may have made some very diff different decisions around where the around where they focused and around where the risks of that of that activity sat 
And so I think, you know, it, it, when, whenever we talk about those kind of practical steps to really integrating ethics, I think it, it does provide the kind of the, the concrete into which you can drive the gateposts of, uh, that underpins everything else. Um, we are going to be doing a round table, all being well, next month as the Institute, together with um, Blueprint for Better Business, where we are going to be exploring some of the interrelationships between having a purpose which is authentic and is inspiring and is practical and is used genuinely to, to drive decision making and the difficult decisions and the culture of the organization and how the two have to reinforce each other. Um, a factual question um, from um, Antoine um, about the study. Were there significant differences between different regions of the world? Because you emphasized in your introduction, Rob, that one of the things that you deliberately set out to do, I think very positively, was to make sure that there was good representation from the Global South. So did you find that there were differences between North America and Asia and, uh, and, and Europe and so on when it comes to these, these, these understandings of, of, of the importance of an ethical culture? Mm, yeah, that's a great question, Antoine. And I think it's, it's something that we are, I mean, we're still looking at the data actually. Um, but I think, so here's one thing I'll, I'll, I will tell you. What is one thing that's really interesting to me is the level of confidence in the capabilities of, of, of a company. So, you know, questions like we, we, we asked in the poll there, we also asked of, of leaders around actually having a clear purpose, um, around, say, valuing people that do the right thing, around, uh, you know, a couple of the other questions that we're going to ask in a moment around the kind of the capabilities of their organization. What is really noticeable to me is Europe and North America are typically substantially more confident in the capabilities of their own organization. Now, that gives you a, a really interesting question, which we are doing more work on, which is, is that reflective of faster progress or is that reflective of overconfidence? Yes. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example of the reason that I suspect it might be the latter. So in the, and this is going back a bit, David will, will remember, um, a series that I used to run uh, with Accenture Strategy and the UN Global Compact um, on CEO attitudes to sustainability. And we asked CEOs two questions. We said, you know, how confident are you in the performance of your company on sustainability and ESG issues? And how do you feel your industry is doing? Now, every single region, bar one, people's confidence in their company would be much higher in their industry. Interestingly, I saw, a, I think it was an Ipsos Mori poll this morning with uh, asking people around behavior when they go back to the pub this week. 95% says, I will behave responsibly when I go back to the pub. 45% say other people will behave responsibly. We saw exactly the same thing. The one region that was different was Latin America. Uh, and in that study, you saw generally a 20 point gap of confidence in my company over my industry. In Latin America, that was reversed. And actually people were more self-effacing if you like more realistic perhaps about the performance of their company versus their industry so it's it's interesting i think it's one of those things that we need to do more work to get under the skin of of whether it's it's genuine performance uh, or whether it's overconfidence but my slightly uninformed punch at the moment is that it's it, it's the latter it's it's a question of overconfidence in some regions i think great now you alluded just then to another question that we would like to pose so if we can put the next question up please so people in my organization or the one that you're most recently familiar with people in my organization act according to a high ethical standard do you agree or disagree so again same procedure please just a quick fire instinctive response overall general perception of how people in your organization currently are behaving okay well any any reactions on on on, on that one so well my, my immediate reaction that's, is that's this, on the purpose one 
Yeah, and, and my immediate reaction actually is that this group is much less bullish than the group that we interviewed and, and surveyed for the study. So just looking at the numbers in the study now, 58% of the CEOs we surveyed uh, selected strongly agree to this question. Now, versus 25% here. Now, I, that perhaps is not a surprise from a group of people who, by virtue of being here and being involved with the IBE, probably have a much broader understanding of ethical standards and, and what that means and actually how high a bar it sets. And I and typically I think you know when we talk to people about this question, the level of confidence tends to uh, correlate almost directly with the breadth of understanding of ethics. So you know a lot of people selecting strongly agree will explain that by saying, well, we don't do anything illegal. No, we haven't stolen anything recently. Whereas people I think you know the more conversant with with ethics become and what ethical standards really mean will say well you know we follow the rules when we have a difficult gray area decision do we always do the right thing do we always apply our own standards and values not always because they, they recognize how hard it is so i think it's it's interesting to me to see that that gap between this group and, and perhaps the, the the broader group of companies thank you now, Robert Smith, another member from the IBE Advisory Council, and of course, um, a very experienced uh, practitioner uh, along the lines that you were just uh, talking about. Rob, so Robert asks about what are the kind of the practical things that you would be saying as a result of this ethics study that a seasoned practitioner inside a company um, should be doing? in terms of trying to drive a stronger ethical culture what what nuggets uh to take away we've talked about the eco bank example already we've talked about salesforce but any other nuggets that you would recommend so so a couple i think the most powerful thing i've seen in the last few years i think as we work with clients on this is leaders who create space in public to talk about difficult decisions and I think actually it goes back to that, what the point we were just discussing of, to me, one of the most dangerous things in trying to embed ethics is this kind of conflation of ethics and compliance. If I have my way, any department called ethics and compliance would be abolished overnight. I think it's an incredibly unhelpful framing that holds people back from acknowledging gray areas, from acknowledging the difficulties of acting according to, to high ethical standards. And one of the most effective examples I've seen is with one firm we work with in, in the US, they started every town hall meeting with a leader talking about a judgment call that they've had to make. And often, and if this leader was feeling brave, a decision that they got wrong and talking through what were the factors in that decision? Why was it complicated? Why was it not just a, a, a simple matter of black and white? And for me, if we've had the kind of tone at the top of people talking around, you know, these are the standards we expect, these are our values, it's translating that down to the more local level, if you like. You know, we know that in big organizations, particularly, the email the CEO sends out, it's an important box to tick, but it's probably not the thing that has the greatest impact on someone's behavior. It's what they see from the leaders they interact with every day. Um, and I think if they're able to show that, you know, we're all managing in these gray areas, it's difficult, we all get it wrong, it makes it possible, I think, for other people to, to admit that, to turn to the person next to them and to say, you know, what do you think about this? And actually, I mean, that, that would be a, a kind of second fact for me is particularly in now so many things are in this environment, right? You know, every, we don't have that hovering in the corridor after a meeting or being in the room first and having a chat. Because in my experience, almost every conversation around a kind of ethical gray area tends to start with the words, can I just run something by you? And I probably won't have booked half an hour for a video call with you in order to do that. It will be when we're walking to lunch or when we're waiting for the coffee machine to start working or when we're you know, arriving at the building in the morning. Without those or with less of that, protecting that space. And actually one organization I'm involved with has started every board meeting recently, Zoom meetings, as all of these things are, but for the meeting and at every, coming back from every break, five minutes, people just paired off one-to-one -one or in small groups of two and three, just to chat. And it's incredible 
how a simple change like that protecting that space for the kind of the informal chit chat the the opportunity to run something by you has really made a difference so i think if there are two things you know beyond the kind of the the, the structural the system things you know around kind of building those metrics for, for culture building ethical decision making frameworks that can really be applied you know to real world business decisions so if i if i put that to one side the things that leaders can just do is those kind of soft nudges those soft signals to to build people's understanding and comfort dealing with and managing in the gray i think those those are two big things that i'm, I'm seeing right now and that's a perfect segue you are a great interviewing lot <laughs> because you are feeding the lions back very nicely it's a perfect segue into a really critical question that so many organizations are now grappling with about what is the workplace of the future going to look like i was interviewing um robbie robertson from deloitte in, in sydney recently for a, a blog um, mm -hmm. on the ibe website about future patterns of work and what's that going to mean in terms of how you create the ethical culture, how you sustain it when you're not face to face as, as much as, as you used to be, because all the predictions seem to be, all the polls that you see is, is that most of us want at least to be able to spend more time working at, from home, working into remote satellite office or whatever in the future than we used to do. So any ideas coming out of the survey in particular about other practical tips like that one about just giving people a bit of space to chat in, in Zoom meetings and so on that, that you would share with us? And actually, I think, honestly, that is the crucial one. It, it's protecting that informal space because I think it's one of those things that we, we take for granted when we're in close proximity is that opportunity to to have those kind of informal conversations. And I think particularly when it comes to that point around speak up, raising a hand, the barriers to someone raising a question formally are so high. You know, if that involves me, you know, booking time with a member of the compliance team or, you know, our in-house counsel, that feels scary. If it's a colleague I can turn to and I can say, can I run this by you? It, it lowers, I think, some of those barriers. And so to me, you know, that ability to, you know, actually if one of one of our team very early on in this pandemic, and it's interesting because principally we've always been remote by design. So, you know, we have 30, 40 people spread across, you know, 15 countries. We, we've never had a kind of common base. We've never spent a lot of time, you know, day to day in, in physical proximity. So we were in some senses better prepared than a lot of organizations, but still we found it tough one of our team set up a virtual office for us where you know you go in and you have a little avatar little cartoon character you sit at a, a desk and people can see that you're there um, you have your video on you have your camera on while you're working so you're not in a meeting but you're just you're there and it's replicating that space and it was really interesting a number of the best conversations i had through last summer through the autumn as people were you know as we all were kind of nervous unsure looking for clarity looking for kind of connection with our colleagues we're actually in that space. So it wasn't when people needed to book a meeting or or being conscious that the time's ticking down, but just space that let people virtually wander up and say, have you got a minute? And so I think if, there, if there's one thing, and again, beyond those kind of systemic points around, you know, one of the biggest dangers I think right now, and you, you mentioned the polls of, we all want to spend three days, four days a week at home. One of the biggest traps I think is for organizations to say, we're going to ask our employees what they want and then do that because of course that's got to be part of the conversation. It probably doesn't directly give you the, the right answer because I think every organization I've worked with has probably underestimated the impact that the, the, the kind of fully remote or, or hybrid model will really have on, on, on the culture, the belonging um, that their people feel to the organization. But I think if, if I pick out one thing, it's maintaining and actually being very active about maintaining that, that informal space. I'm sure that's a really important um, um, kind of warning shot about people thinking of, of, of going too much to, to allowing working from, from, from home. Um, we're virtually out of time. 
and we could we're getting some really good further comments suggestions a, a, an interesting question from from john bygate um which i'm not going to ask you unless you really want to to comment on uh, rob to do so about is mandating covid vaccinations or not going to be one of the next big ethical issues for responsible ethical indeed all employers um you may have seen ian peters well, our director commenting on that in a no, I, I, the other day and so on. i'll give you a very quick response there and i think it's a perfect example of an ethical gray area it's a perfect example of where there is no right answer because you're trading off you know private liberties and and rights to to choose versus you know duty of care to your employees but also you know kind of broader questions around institutions and businesses role in promoting public health um so i think it's, it's one of those questions that is a perfect example of an ethical dilemma because there isn't a right answer it's, it's navigating shades of gray um and actually perhaps john I, I would be very happy to to chat more about that because it's something we've we, we've done a fair bit of thinking about because yeah actually we came back from the christmas break to find i think you know four or five clients within the first 48 hours asking us exactly that question because i think it's it's tough and uh, and an invitation to john or indeed to anyone else on the webinar if you feel strongly about this or indeed any other issue do feel free to submit a blog that we will consider for the ibe guest uh, uh, blogs on, on on the website which we produce a new one um, every week so please do submit your ideas if you feel really strongly about a particular topic Seems to me also that the discussion this afternoon, <coughs> excuse me, has really thrown up some important questions about how we best collate um, some of the interesting innovations like Rob's virtual office with the avatars where you can go and just, just tap somebody metaphorically on the shoulder and so on. But I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Our next IB event, uh, 27th of April, we've got a masterclass around um, training um, in ethics. And then on the 29th of April, my old business in the community, former colleague, John O'Brien, and his co-author, David Gallagher, are talking about their new book, which is all about purpose, particularly in the context of the PR and communications sector. So like today, a free webinar open to, to you to sign up for. But Rob, thank you once again. It's been great pleasure doing this webinar and also working closely with you on the ethics study. Good luck.